Absalom. If only I died instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, we, we rejoice and we're joyful because you're uh, full of love and mercy and mighty to save. Now help us to realize that a little more clearly today as we see through David's example how you love your enemies and you would rather die for us than live without us. We pray you're glorified here in the presentation of your word. We pray you're glorified through uh, us as your hands and feet of Jesus, just the body and bride of Christ. May we be faithful to serve you here. Help us, Lord, to plant water. We know all the increase comes from you. We pray it all in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. To really get caught up here to 2 Samuel 18, Absalom dies, you got to know a little bit more about the story. Well, King David had uh, King David had some uh, he had some women. I mean, when you read 2 Samuel 3, he had women by, I believe, about seven different women. He had children. He had children by about seven different women there. That's a bunch. You'll see today he also had ten concubines. And when he left Jerusalem, he, didn't, he just left them behind. He had a bunch of women. And he had a bunch of children with these women. And two of them whose names you need to know right now, uh, the firstborn son, the firstborn son of David, you might guess Solomon. David was king and Solomon was king. That's not correct. The firstborn son was Amnon. And then there was a second son. And then the third son, the thirdborn son was Absalom. Well, uh, as the story unfolds here in 2 Samuel, uh, Amnon, the firstborn, he had a crush. For all you single folks out there, you can roll that. You know me? That's all right. <clears throat> the problem was his crush was actually on his half sister. Now, he, he had a half sister. They had the same daddy, David, but they had different brothers. Well, Amnon fell in love with this. She's a beautiful girl. The Bible says that. God's word's true. It says she's pretty. I mean, she's pretty. And uh, so Amnon fell in love with his si half sister. Well, his sister, half-sister, Tamar, Tamar was a full sister to Absalom. And as it unfolds, Amnon, he, he wanted her so bad, he lusted for her. He pretended like he was sick, and when he had her bring him food, he attacked her. He overcame her. He was stronger than she was, and he raped her. This, this is really PG-13 kind of story, you know. Uh, he rapes his half-sister. Amnon did. And remember, that's, that's Absalom's full sister. When Absalom heard about that, you think he's happy? He had like his hair. No. No, he wasn't happy. He wasn't happy at all. In fact, he was, he was absolutely living. He, and he went on for, I don't know, two years. Two years, it just boiled up inside and festered running over. And he's sick and tired. That firstborn son, Amnon. So he throws apart. The Bible says in 2 Samuel 13, two years later, Absalom said to David, he said, Dad, he said, I'm going to throw me a party. I'm going to throw a party. Everybody should come. In fact, I want all my brothers, sisters, everybody come out to my party one big time. Dad, the Bible says in 2 Samuel 13, verse 26, Dad, please, please let my brother Amnon come with us. He deceives his daddy into giving permission for Amnon to go to the party. And while they were at the party, Absalom attacked and overcame and killed his brother Amnon. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. This is King David, the giant killer. David killed Goliath. King David, a man after God's own heart, right in David's house. One son raped a daughter and killed her her brother killed the man who raped him. Man, that's, <clears throat> that's messed up. Hey, when you read through the Bible, you will find in that Bible people who are just as big and knuckleheads as you and me. And that should really give us a little bit of comfort. Those people are just like us. And some of you all like me, we put the K in knucklehead. You know what I'm saying? And in David's house, no exception. Just total disaster and mess. 
And when Absalom killed Amnon, well, he fled. He fled to a town called Geshur. I'll let you read it. The Bible says Absalom fled, and he fled and went to Geshur, and he stayed there three years. Now, y'all know one of the Ten Commandments is, Thou shalt not kill. And if you kill like that, then, uh, you know, you should be put to death. Absalom's afraid for his life. He flees for three years. When they finally get him to come back to Jerusalem, well, David won't even see him. The Bible says uh, Absalom, he went to... Uh, Absalom lived, he came back to Jerusalem, and he lived two years in Jerusalem without seeing the king's face. Three years plus two years, five total. He hadn't even seen his daddy's face. He betrayed his daddy, he killed his brother, the firstborn son of the king, the firstborn son, Absalom killed him. And, but you, you got to know about Absalom, he, he's also, if you know one thing about him, <clears throat> that boy's good looking. The Bible says about him, it says that in all Israel, there was not a man so highly praised for his handsome appearance as, as, as Absalom. From the top of his head to the toe of his foot, there was no blemish in him. You girls would have seen him. Here comes Absalom. <whistles> Woo! <laughs> Woo, he's pretty. He's handsome. He wasn't handsome. The Bible says he's handsome. The top of his head, bottom of his foot, no blemish on him. That boy's a good looking boy. <sighs> And because he's a good-looking boy, because he is a king's son, the king's son, he, and he knows there's turmoil, he wants to be king. And, but you know, you're son number three, and the chance of son number three getting to be king just ain't real good. And so he decides he's got to take it to his own hands. So he sets up shop, if you will. He sets up outside of Jerusalem, so when people come to Jerusalem uh, to plead their case with the king, whatever it is, then Absalom cuts them off. And what he said was, what the Bible said, well, if you read it, it says, uh, uh, he would say to the people, he would say, your claims are valid and proper. Whatever their claims were, it didn't matter. Somebody stole my sheep. Somebody moved my property line. It doesn't matter. Oh, your claims are valid and proper, but there's no representative of the king to hear you. And Absalom would add, if only I were appointed judge in the land, then everyone who has a complaint or case could come to me. I would see that he gets justice. Also, when everyone approached him or bowed down before him, Absalom would reach out his hand, take hold of him, and kiss him. Absalom behaved in this way toward all the Israelites who came to the king asking for justice, and so he stole the hearts of the men of Israel. This happened for four years. Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel period of four years. This handsome prince of the king, you know. Whatever their case, whatever their case was, he said, you're right, your claims are valid, they're proper. If only there was a judge, we need a judge. If only there was a judge. If only I were appointed judge. I could help you. I would be on your side. He stole the hearts of the people. Moreover, he wants to be king, so he gets all these people riled up, and he starts his own movement. You might call it a coup. You might call it an insurrection. He has an army of followers. He decides, Absalom does, he's going to take the throne by force. Absalom goes with all his men and his army, and they go up to attack Jerusalem. David, if you're blind, this is the same David. Do your head like this right here. What's he going to do when his own son comes with an army to take his life? What's he going to do? David fled Jerusalem. The Bible says David, it said David, when he left Jerusalem, he went up the Mount of Olives. The, the Mount of Olives, that's the mountain that Jesus ascended into heaven from in Acts chapter 1. Same place. David left Jerusalem, he ascended, continued up the Mount of Olives, weeping as he went. His head was covered, and he was barefoot. It doesn't look like a giant slayer to me. What do you think? David weeping as he goes, barefoot to, head covered, he leaves Jerusalem. That's called the city of David, the city of God. It's called Bozeman. He's leaving his town. But he didn't leave the palace completely empty. In fact, David left some concubines, ten. He left ten concubines. That was wives of his. 
He left ten women and wives of his behind to take care of the palace. And the Bible says when Absalom came to town, there was uh, nobody was there except for these women. And it says, it says they pitched a tent for Absalom on the roof of the palace, and he lay with his father's concubines in the sights of all Israel. Everybody knew what that tent was for, what was going on on the palace rooftop. And you're, you now know that in 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 11, 2 Samuel 11, that's when David, uh, David, he took Uriah the Hittite, he took his wife, he had sexual relations with another man's wife, the baby later died, David had that man's, uh, that woman's husband put to death, and the Bible says, there's 2 Samuel 11, that's where it's recorded, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, the prophet of God, Nathan, came to David and said, you've done this, it's guilty, God knows about it, and trouble will never leave your house. You did it in secret, and now you're one of your very own household will do it in broad daylight. And that's what Absalom's doing. The word of the Lord is coming to fruition for even David, the giant slayer, a man after God's own heart. Absalom lay with his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. Well, Absalom is in Jerusalem. David fled out of the city. He, he crossed the Jordan River and he goes over to the territory of Ephraim. And the territory of Ephraim was a hill country with a forest. David now takes up a refuge in a, in a village there and uh, Absalom is in pursuit. And now there's going to be and there is a battle between David's men and Absalom's men in the forest. It's a great battle. In fact, 20,000 men died that day. The Bible says in 2 Samuel 18, it says the casualties were great. 20,000 men that day. Notice verse 8 says the force claims more lives that day than the sword. I'm reminded in the book of Joshua where the Israelites, Joshua pursues the enemy. The Bible says there was a hailstorm. And it says, more died from the hailstorm than died from the sword of the Israelites. Here, more died from the forest than died from David's men. Specifically, Absalom had a mule. He had his men. He's going into battle in this forest. And Absalom is riding on a mule. And as he's riding on this mule, he's handsome. Absalom is. He's handsome, no blemish on him, top of his head, bottom of his feet. But he also had his pretty hair. The Bible says he'd cut it every year, weigh a certain amount, and he'd sell his hair or whatever. I don't know if he sold it, but he, I don't think he had lots of love back then. But uh, he, he had a certain amount of hair. He's, he's known for this hair. And as he goes into battle on his mule, his hair gets caught in a tree. And he's hanging in a tree. And even though David had given orders, David had given orders not to take his life, Joab, the commander of David's army, finds Absalom hanging in a tree by his head, still alive, hanging by his head in a tree, and Joab takes a spear and stabs him in the heart. And that's where this whole sermon started. When David gets word that Absalom is dead, in 2 Samuel 18, verse 33, that's where we started. The king was shaken. He went up to the room over the gateway and he went. As he went, he said, Oh, my son Absalom, if only I had died <coughs> instead of you. Oh, Absalom, my son, my son. Make, make no mistake about this. Absalom was public enemy number one. Absalom had, had betrayed his daddy. He didn't throw the party and kill his brother. You remember that? He killed his brother. He deserved to die. He formed a coup and insurrection, which is also unlawful and immoral both. And he drives his daddy out of town. He sleeps with his daddy's wives. The Bible says in Leviticus 20, Leviticus 20, verse 11, if a man sleeps with his father's wife, both the man and the woman shall be put to death. I mean, that man deserved to die. You hear what the king said? Oh, my son, Absalom, if only I had died instead of you. Joab, Joab was actually a, uh, he was a son to David's sister. Joab was David's nephew. 
Joab was the commander of the army. He was David's nephew. And Joab went to him in 2 Samuel 19. Joab about to pull his own hair out. Said, dude, what's wrong with you? It's recorded in these words. And he said, today, today you'll be humiliated. Your men have just saved your life. Joab says, you can hear it in his voice. I don't understand you. Joab said to David, said, you love those who hate you. You get up, go out and encourage your men. Which David did do. And he did go back to Jerusalem. But notice, a man after God's own heart. I don't understand that boy. He loves those who hate him. You hear what he said in verse 33? Absalom, if only I died instead of you. You see, this story, is, it's about David and Absalom. It's about turmoil in the king's house. It's about a man after God's own heart. But it's really, it's one big harmonious story all the way through the Bible. This man who had God's heart, if only I died, he did deserve to die, but if only I died instead of him. That's the story summed up in the entire Bible. You see, in the pinnacle, the pinnacle of creation in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, the stars, everything that exists. The pinnacle, the top of the ladder was mankind. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. Let us make man in our image. So we made them both male and female. The pinnacle creation, mankind. God created man in the way God describes our disobedience. All have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. It's not just Adam and Eve in the garden, it's you and I in our sin. God described our disobedience in this way. In Isaiah chapter 1, verse 2, God said, I reared up children. I brought them up, but they rebelled against me. God said, I brought up children. <coughs> they rebelled against me. And see, God, the heart of God, He's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. God did in the fullness of time the absolute unthinkable. You can hear what He did, what David said in 2 Samuel chapter 18, verse 33. If only I had died instead of you. God did the unthinkable. And can you hear what the Spirit says to the church recorded in John's Gospel, chapter 3, verse 16? God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. If only I had died instead of you. That's exactly what God did do through Christ at Calvary. I want to share with you this old, this old story. I've heard it. It's old parable, I guess you would call it. It's a hundred years old or so, but um, you've probably heard it before. But listen up, I'll let you hear it one more time. It goes like this. It says, uh, this is years ago, you know, a hundred years ago, a preacher, a preacher was walking through town. He saw a little boy carrying a box. The preacher said to the little boy, he said, he said, son, what's in that box? The boy pulled the lid back just a little, and they could see in there uh, three little wild sparrows, three little birds. They were shivering, they were cold, they were frightened. The preacher said to the little boy, said, what are you going to do with those birds, boy? The little boy was young and mischievous and mean too. The little boy said, I'm going to take them home and have some fun with these birds. I'm going to tease them, I'm going to pull out their feathers, I'll teach them to fight each other, I've got some cats and I'm going to scare these old birds with my cats. I'm going to have me a real good time with these birds. The preacher said, uh, when you get tired of tormenting those birds, what are you going to do? The little boy said, I don't know. I'll probably just uh, kill them or give them to my cats. The preacher thought about it for a minute. He said, uh, how much you want for those birds? The little boy was surprised. He said, sir, you don't, you don't want these birds. They're just plain old field birds. They don't even sing. They aren't even pretty. The preacher said, how much you want for them birds? The little boy just asked him. Outrageous price, especially for the time. He said, I don't know. I'll tell you what, I'll take $10 for them. The preacher, in the boy's amazement, he took out of his pocket $10 bill. 
He gave the little boy in a flash. The little boy was gone. The preacher set the birds free. The preacher later told this in the sermon relative to that particular story. The preacher said, uh, one day Satan and Jesus were having a conversation. Satan had just come from down on earth around the Garden of Eden. He was gloating, he was boasting, and he said, yes, sir, I caught me a bunch of people, world full people down here, just set me a trap, used some bait, I knew they couldn't resist, I got them. Jesus said, what are you going to do with those people? Satan said, I don't know, I think I'll just have some fun with them. I'll teach them, I'll teach them to hate each other and abuse each other. I'll teach them how to make alcohol and drinks, so they'll get drunk, you know, make stuff to smoke, they'll be cussing each other. I'll teach them how to invent guns and bombs, kill each other. I'm going to have me some fun with these people down here. Jesus said, when you get done, what are you going to do with them? Satan said, I, I'll just kill them or, or let them destroy each other. Jesus said, uh, <clears throat> how much you want for them people down there? Satan said, uh, kind of surprised, he said, oh, you don't want those people. Those people aren't good for nothing. They'll hate you and spit on you and curse you and kill you. You don't want those people. Jesus said, how much? And Satan, the most outrageous price he could ask. And I'll tell you what it'd take. It'll take all your blood, all your tears, and all your life. And Jesus said, that's the deal. You see, uh, a man after God's own heart, you just get a glimpse of it here. He wrote a bunch of psalms. He taught us about worship. You read the psalms of King David. You read about his heart and his worship. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David can teach us a lot. But I believe he doesn't teach anything more important than what we learned in 2 Samuel 18, 33. Absalom, my son, if only I had died instead of you. The heart of God is found in that verse. It's what the Bible is all about. God would rather die for you than live without you. Amazing love. How could it be? That you, my king, would die for me. How wide, long, and high and deep is the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. All God's asking for us is not that we keep rules and sit in a building and read a book. It's about us getting to know him because we love him and love us first. We'll never earn salvation, but we can accept the free gift of grace. And through the blood of Jesus, you and I can be forgiven. He would rather die for us than live without us. Through his sacrifice, we can be set free. All he's asking is that we love him. Jesus taught in John 14, verse 23 and 4, he said, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. It's all about, it's, it's never about sitting in a building. It's about loving Christ and serving Him with all of your heart. It's never about reading a book. It's never about reading the Bible. I've done my Bible day check mark. It's about knowing who the author is and living for His glory. It's about new life. And it's possible He loves His enemies. Even those that would spit on Him and flog Him and kill Him, He would say, Look, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. He's not willing that any should perish, but all should be called repentance. And just as we saw in our 930 service this morning, we had somebody to obey the gospel of Jesus, and you can do the same today. To be saved, to be redeemed, to be added to the church. You can come believing that He is Lord of all, repenting of your sins, making your confession with your lips, and be united with Christ in His death. Not by water, but by the blood of Jesus, your sins can be washed away. You can receive the indwelling Holy Spirit of God and go on your way rejoicing as a child of God. In the true sense of the word. Today is the day of salvation. I said, would you go over and get the praise team for me? As he goes to get the praise team, I remind you today, if you have a decision for the cause of Christ, any decision at all to become a Christian, to rededicate your life, any decision, 
As we all stand, as we sing, if you have a decision for Christ, we invite you, we encourage you, we plead with you. Jesus died for you so you can live. We invite you to come.